Okay. We've seen uh, how to get at a batch reactor design equation and how to use it briefly. And um, before we dive further into batch reactors, I think it now makes sense to um, go over all the different uh, reactor types. Um, but um, rather than just give you a bunch of, of um, you know, uh, derivations um, for different reactor types, I thought I'd at least start um, departing from batch reactors by talking about some advantages and disadvantages. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages for um, the other reactor types too, but for the sake of um, brevity, at least in this lecture, I won't um, go into all of those. But just to give you a sense of, of why you might not, well, why you might want to use a batch reactor first and then why you might not. Um, you know, we've talked about in OCHEM, uh, organic chemistry or in um, uh, your brewing cases, um, you're, those are likely to be batch. So part of that is because it's really uh, quick and easy, relatively speaking, to set up a batch reactor. Uh, and they're flexible across a lot of different kinds of reaction types. Um, so, you know, it takes a lot more effort and parts to get um, flows in and out. Um, and um, you know, uh, there might be a variety of other reasons why um, it, you might just want to set something up in, in one vessel and, and let it incubate. Um, uh, a lot of times where you see this um, uh, are for high value, um, low compound products, uh, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and so batch reactors um, may not scale as well. Um, but there are smaller scales, um, and, and when you need just small quantities of things, whether it's in a lab or, or like I was saying, in a pharmaceutical manufacturing context, um, batch might, might be perfect uh, for you for that. Um, I guess I already mentioned in regards to flexibility some things about operation and design, how, how easy it is um, to set up. Um, so I'm kind of mixing a few of these advantages, um, including, for example, reactions with a long residence time. Well, so um, fermentation, uh, the process where you have um, cells, um, uh, you know, uh, ferment or make products um, uh, sitting in, in, in reactor vessels for a long period of time. Um, that's actually how many of these high value, low volume um, pharmaceutical products are made. But it just in general, if you need something uh, to, to be uh, incubating is a term that I'm using again here um, for for a long if, for for a long period of time you don't want it to be pushed out of the reactor volume because of flow um, and so those are some advantages um, and and so now if we um, think about uh, some some disadvantages here um, uh, one of the 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 disadvantages that we might see is um, um, because it's not continuous, um, there has to be some element of, of downtime between batches. Downtime between batches. Um, okay, so imagine that um, the, the brewing case um, where you're brewing beer, uh, you finish making your batch of homebrew, and then what do you have to do? You have to clean it out. You have to sterilize it and wait for that to dry and all of that. So that's some significant downtime. Think about all the, the time that might add um, in industry. Uh, so we'll also mention here cleaning, um, costly, labor intensive. Um, you know, this isn't really the most efficient way to do things. Um, efficiency. I'll just say efficiency, not great. Um, I mean, if you're really trying to make a large quantity of things and, and uh, use your time more effectively, maybe the volume more effectively, and we can talk about uh, why that might be, then um, batch isn't really the way that you wanna do that. Um, and um, the other thing is at large scale, so large scale production, large scale production, generally more difficult more difficult. 
So those are those are some disadvantages here of batch reactors. So let's go ahead and uh, look at um, uh, just a, a preview of um, of different. So reactors. yeah, here here's your batch reactor um, diagram and uh, and and term, and then you have your three other reactor types that are going to be of interest in this course: CSTRs, semi-batch, plug flow. Um, and so if we want to look first at what all these um, uh, diagrams might look like differently, um, uh, we, we can start to draw out what a CSTR looks like. So continuously stirred a tank reactor. So we're going to have a tank and we're going to have a stir. Um, and now the, the difference is that we're going to have um, a flow coming in and we're going to have flow coming out. Um, what what um, definitionally separates the semi-batch um, from these. It's similar to a batch uh, and a hybrid of a batch and CSDR. So you have, um, once again, um, your, your vessel that's being stirred, and then you have um, just one um, stream coming in, um, and no, uh, meaning that you don't have anything leaving the reactor, uh, no flow out. Um, and then in a, uh, the plug flow case, so I'll draw a tube, um, with an opening here, um, you've got uh, so you've got a reactor happening uh, essentially across the cylinder, um, and you've got flow in and out. And so now, if we if we try to say what what's different in all these cases, um, you know, you in a batch as as we saw, you have concentration changing with time. Um, you might also have um, temperature, um, and and uh, so these. Um, change with time. Uh, your CSTR, your continuously stirred tank reactor, one of the, the definitional assumptions is that um, you operate it at steady state. Uh, of course, there might be a startup phase uh, and a shutdown phase where it's not at steady state, but otherwise it is. Um, here you've got uh, a semi-batch um, situation where, okay, you don't you don't have flow come going out, so it can't be at steady state. Um, not steady state. Um, in fact, it looks like your volume will probably change. Um, and then um, finally, you've got plug flow um, happening at steady state. Um, but um, as I highlighted in an earlier um, video, you, you don't have so not uniform. Um, spatially. And so each of these different reactor types are things that you not only would commonly encounter in, in industrial settings, but they each uh, throw a wrench into the, the um, generalized um, uh, balance uh, a little differently, forcing you to encounter a slightly different situation and then understand mathematically how to treat that. Okay. So now if we dive into CSTRs, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, pose the question here, you know, how does our approach change when components flow in and out? And so I've already drawn a simplified representation of this kind of reactor, but I'll just draw it again here. Um, you have flow going in and flow going out. You have a molar flow rate for your species I um, in, and you have that out. If you're thinking about what's in your reactor, you've got um, uh, you know, a given reactor volume, VR. Maybe I'll just use a different color here to be able, so it's more visible. You've got um, that net generation, of course, um, and you've got a, a given temperature that this um, reaction may be happening in. Okay, um, let's talk about assumptions. Um, so assume. Assume one, um, that everything is well mixed. Um, so continuously stirred, everything is well mixed within the reactor. All of uh, those infinitesimal volumes, all dVs have um, the same Ci and Gi. Okay, uh, what else can we assume here? Um, that um, reactions only occur, reactions only occur 
in uh, VR in the in the volume of the reactor within the reactor. Um, so I mentioned that before, um, but you know here it's kind of you might wonder, okay, well if I if I say um, uh, had two fluids, uh, two separate streams of reactants come into a vessel and then they encounter one another and they start reacting and colliding and they're both still present in the outstream, why wouldn't they keep reacting here? Well, you know, you just have to assume that they're not going to. And in reality, they might not because maybe in your volume, you have some kind of a catalyst um, that doesn't end up pulling out. Um, maybe the temperature quickly drops um, in your outstream or you, you quickly encounter some other unit operation that um, effectively uh, sh uh, turns off this reaction. So there's also no reaction happening um, if you've got a mixed stream coming in. Um, it's only happening here. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, so what that means, um, so I guess I'll use the therefore symbol up there and I'll also say here, um, you have a step change in concentration in CI, and I'll also say, and um, possibly um, T uh, from feed to reactor. Okay, so just uh, revisiting what I was saying before again, maybe you've got two components, you know they're not reacting, but they're coming in at maybe 300 degrees Celsius, and uh, your reactor is at 400 degrees Celsius. Well, okay, so there's a step change that happens that you just say occurs right there instantaneously. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to also say as a third assumption, I'll just move over here, um, steady state. Uh, and those assumptions are going to mean that um, our volumetric flow rate, little v out, is equal to little v in. Our vr is constant. Okay, so with these assumptions, um, we're ready to start using the uh, design, uh, the generalized balance. Um, and so if we go back to what that looks like, in minus out, Plus generation, I'll just give that a net equals assumption. Uh, accumulation, sorry. Um, we have an Fi not uh, coming in. We have an Fi going out. Um, we already said that our, um, our uh, reactor is spatially uniform. So I'm just going to go ahead and write the net generation term as the rate of formation of species I times the whole reactor volume. Sort of skipping a step from earlier. And our accumulation is still the number of moles uh, changing per time, so dn, i, dt. Um, now, we said it's at steady state. So if that's true, then we have um, dn, i, dt equals zero. Okay, so our derivative in this expression uh, went away, and so we're left with now instead of in a differential equation, just an algebraic equation. Look at that. It's got three terms though. It's got more terms than we had before, and and we know that um, well, R i might be an interesting term, so you still have to to substitute in for R i, um, but you're unlikely to. to to see any differentials here, because if you think about at least what Ri might commonly be, I mean, if for if for example, uh, if Ra, uh, if there was an A, was negative KCA, you can already see that there's not there's not going to be a differential um, equation once you you make that kind of substitution. Um, so just to, to put it in, in a, a, to rearrange things and make it look a little bit more like a book equation, um, you can say that the volume of a CSDR uh, is uh, equal to the flow, molar flow rate of species I coming in minus the molar flow rate of species I going out over minus Ri, the rate of formation of species I. 
and that equation right there is equation um, 3-16 from Roberts. Um, so that's a that's a good place to stop for now at the CSTR. There, there will be more useful equations, transformations that relate to conversion, but we'll talk about that next time.